Once upon a time, gaming was neither targeted at a specific age or sex. It was something that sold itself. Kids would play games at home, and adults would play games at the bar while waiting for drinks. It was understood that it was something that everyone could enjoy. But following the video game crash of 83, many things changed in order to prevent a similar crash from ever happening again, and two of those things were market research and targeted marketing. It was found that, on average, a younger toy-buying audience was more interested in video games than adults, particularly that of a male demographic. As such, it became sort of a chicken and an egg situation. It became the common consensus among society that games were for kids, in particular boys, and that understanding brought us the North American Nintendo boom of the mid to late 80s. Of course, games were always violent to a point, but the presentation for many years at least appeared comparatively tame or family-friendly enough that nobody but the most crazy of zealots batted an eye. Even while mowing down legions of living, breathing people, it was still considered wholesome family fun that kept your kids occupied while you drank yourself to death. But as the kids of the 80s turned into the adolescents of the 90s, there was a natural growing desire for more mature games as the average gamer's age increased. Many people decided that gaming was something that they should grow out of, but many others disagreed, which created a demand for more mature games. Some developers agreed, which is what brought us such games as Doom and Mortal Kombat, games that went completely against the notion that games were for kids, with blood and hardcore violence aplenty, which forced regulation and the formation of the ESRB in North America and things like Peggy in Europe. This era opened the floodgates for blood, violence, and adult themes to run rampant in the gaming sphere throughout the mid to late 90s, with some games like Thrill Kill pushing the boundaries of taste so far that they were effectively banned. But even still, gaming as a whole was seen as something that children did, a notion held even while Sub-Zero was ripping people's heads off. Games still generally had a stigma about them that if you were an adult who played them, you were some sort of loser or nerd. I should specify I'm not claiming this was right or wrong, rather I'm just bringing it up to demonstrate the attitudes of the time. Meanwhile, games targeted at kids were still very successful. The Crash Bandicoot trilogy was the 7th, 8th, and 11th best-selling PS1 games respectively. But as the adolescents of the 90s became the adults of the 2000s, and more and more people refused to buy into the notion that they should have grown out of games because that's like growing out of television, the average gamer's age had increased to the point that a seismic shift felt to be brewing. The market was now such that it could tolerate going fully adult. Not only tolerate it, but embrace it. And with that, in October of 2001, a game would be released that would change the perception and direction of gaming forever. And that game was Grand Theft Auto 3. Grand Theft Auto was always a controversial series. In the late 90s, as parents groups and politicians were looking into video games as sort of a boogeyman to blame various atrocities on, especially as blood and violence became more common, Grand Theft Auto was one of the designated video game boogeymen of its time, along with Mortal Kombat and Postal. But in the case of GTA, controversy would forevermore continue to follow this series like the smell of stale sweat follows a brony. In fact, the Im <laughs> I can't believe I actually said that. <clears throat> In fact, the amount of controversy raised by the early games was mild, and I mean very, very mild, compared to what would come. Still, as tends to be the case, the controversy that was created by these parents' groups and politicians only bolstered the profile of the Grand Theft Auto franchise in its early days. As such, the first two Grand Theft Auto games sold a combined 4-5 to five million units, far from the best-selling games of the generation, but a modest success by an unproven studio. In the early days, the most noteworthy opposition to the Grand Theft Auto franchise was an English publicist by the name of Max Clifford. This is a fact that's somewhat lost to time, as there was a much more famous figurehead to the anti-Grand Theft Auto movement to come. More on that later. Either way, audiences latched on to the go-anywhere sandbox freedom that the early GTA games offered, but the somewhat limited presentation meant that it left a little impact in the grand scheme of things, at least compared to other popular games at the time. However, that would all change with the release of the third main installment of the franchise. GTA 3 was initially sold on its groundbreaking technology and unparalleled scope. Where games like Driver 2 before it had offered a semi-open 3D world, GTA 3 offered never-before-seen freedom. The freedom to go anywhere and do anything in a fully 3D world. You could do one of hundreds of missions or tasks, or you could just screw around in the open world as you chose. You could kill anyone, drive any car, and do things that were unthinkable in games up to then. Collect drugs, bank prostitutes, and take part in the seedy underbelly of organized crime in possibly the most cinematic video game story up to that point. That said, just being revolutionary has never equated guaranteed success. Something like Jurassic Park Trespasser was revolutionary for its time, but was a critical and commercial failure. The thing about GTA 3 was that it was revolutionary in the right direction. Realism and freedom to this degree was something that had never been done before, especially not in full 3D. Despite games trying for a time, it was something that was largely impossible until the sixth generation. 
And the idea of true blue, go anywhere, do anything freedom is something that's inherently appealing in a consequence free realm like video games. It was the exact type of revolutionary gameplay that while people may not have realized that they wanted it as soon as they had it or heard that they could have it, it was exactly what they wanted video games to be. So audiences initially gravitated towards it because of that. However, some of the things that they gave you freedom to do were seen as radical, unnecessary, and horrible. So once the greater media got a look at it, that's when the real fun began. Grand Theft Auto 3 shattered the perception of video games to the larger masses as being a wholesome thing for kids. Politicians and parents the world over blew their lids like never before over the extreme adult themes never before seen in any mainstream game up to that point. You could freely kill anyone, including cops. You could bank prostitutes and kill them to get your money back. That was a big one, by the way. You can collect drugs, you could steal cars, these were just some of the things that these people latched onto. All of these things shocked the masses. It was unthinkable that a wholesome little hobby that kids had been doing for 20 years could suddenly contain such horrible themes. Which is a quaint thing to think about looking back, considering how many worse games have come along since. Just as it's quaint when you consider that this game was once quote unquote realistic. Many, many worse games have come along, GTA 3 was just the band-aid being ripped off. The argument that they latched onto was the poisoning the youth claptrap that we've heard time and again. Now, anybody with half a brain would know that video games don't cause violence. At worst, it could inspire an act of violence within somebody who already has mental issues. As a matter of fact, there have been studies which have been done which concluded that having violence as play can create an outlet for people who would otherwise become violent. Also, the game was rated M, which means that nobody under 17 should have been playing this game. A message that went over the heads of the cultural sticklers who believed that GTA 3 could begin an era of normalized cultural violence and degeneracy. Suddenly, GTA 3 was a boogeyman that a whole bunch of different atrocities started being blamed on without any verifiable evidence. As a matter of fact, GTA 3 was also the game that brought to the table someone who would be synonymous with the words GTA and controversy, that being notorious anti-video game lawyer Jack Thompson. In fact, not only anti-video game, but anti-rap, anti-obscenity, basically he was a puritanical bastard who believed that anything slightly edgy was poison to the minds of the youth. He was involved in two separate lawsuits against Rockstar for GTA 3 and would go on to sue Rockstar Games so many times, and I mean for pretty much every game they made, that he was eventually disbarred for his flagrant abuse of his position. So thankfully, the courts were on our side and understood that his lawsuits were spurious, unconstitutional, and had no legs whatsoever. Although it helps that Jack Thompson was blatantly incompetent. So the shocking nature of Grand Theft Auto 3 sparked what's dubbed a moral panic. Attempts to ban the game were issued, and even successful in some areas of the world including Australia, which had a history of refusing classification to games that they deemed immoral. Although a censored version was eventually released. The outrage in the media coverage was ceaseless, but as ever, controversy creates cash. Grand Theft Auto 3 became one of the most highly publicized games of its time, because the mainstream media's ceaseless reporting on this allegedly horrible thing gave Grand Theft Auto 3 boatloads of free mainstream advertising, putting a spotlight on it like no other game. Meaning that a game that was already destined for success became a mainstream hit like no other, and when you look at it, GTA 3 really was lightning in a bottle. Controversy creates cash, yes, but the success of Grand Theft Auto 3 was unparalleled for the time. Something like Postal may have been controversial for its time and was definitely a success sales-wise for what it was, but it sold peanuts compared to GTA 3. No, here's what it is. GTA 3 was always going to be a success because of its revolutionary gameplay. The novelty of a go-anywhere sandbox was enough, but the media circus that surrounded GTA 3 made people more aware of the game and its revolutionary unparalleled gameplay. It was a game that in theory sold itself, but the controversy just made the wider masses who may not have been aware of the game much more aware of it. So had the game not been revolutionary in its own right, it wouldn't have sold half as well. But the gameplay combined with the content combined with the controversy created the video game equivalent of a money printing machine. From there, its sudden and monumental success changed gaming forever. You see, up until then, games were still very split as far as presentation was concerned. You had light-hearted platformers running alongside first-person shooters and violent fighting games, and they were equally as popular and viable sales-wise. But where GTA 3 stopped being a popular game and started becoming a landmark title in the history of video games is in how it affected the market. Suddenly, adults, even those who bought into the stigma that video games were for kids, had a game all their own that was trendy, fun, and they could play without feeling like they were being childish. Furthermore, trends amongst adults and teens will more often than not dictate trends amongst kids because kids will perceive what adults and teens like as being the thing that they need to like to be considered adult and therefore cool. 
trends like this weren't unheard of in video games. The reason the PlayStation was able to sell over 100 million units was because Sony marketed the PlayStation towards an adult and teenage audience, where the N64 was geared more towards kids, an outdated business model that as a result plastered the N64 with the stigma of being too kiddy for adults and subsequently too kiddy for its own target audience at the time. But even still, games marketed towards younger players were still very viable, Crash, Spyro, and Gex to name a few, but there was never a game geared towards adults that had the same profile as Grand Theft Auto 3, and being popular amongst adults like it was, regardless of what was in the game, meant that Grand Theft Auto 3 became the de facto cool kids game on the playground. Suddenly, all kids wanted to play was GTA and games like GTA, because the quality of games weren't as important as the perception, and nobody wanted to play games perceived as being for babies. Growing up around this time, this is something that I experienced. It became sort of a forbidden fruit, and if you could convince your parents to buy it for you, you were the man on the playground. And of course, that doesn't even account for the teens and adults who were already playing games before this. With the release of Grand Theft Auto 3 and the subsequent media firestorm, GTA 3 became the game to own for the average older gamer, not only on its own merits, but as a protest against the media and politicians who wanted to dictate what was and wasn't an appropriate way to spend our time. GTA 3 became less of a game and more of a movement, an act of defiance, so when you combine all of these factors, one thing becomes clear. It was the right game at the right time doing the right things. Truly lightning in a bottle that used a number of elements both in and out of the game that made GTA 3 the game to own for a great many people. It used the foundation of groundbreaking gameplay and free publicity from the morally panicking media, and from there, the controversy and attempted banning made it the game to own amongst average older gamers as a defiant middle finger towards people trying to dictate their hobby. It became something that the non-game-playing public could enjoy without being seen as nerdy or childish. Its popularity and adult themes made it the holy grail amongst kids. Everybody wanted to own it, essentially meaning that overnight the entire gaming landscape shifted so that nobody really wanted games targeted at a younger demographic, even said younger demographic. As I've said in the past, nobody wanted to be the next Crash Bandicoot. Everybody wanted to be the next GTA in order to try and leech off that monumental success, and all that the majority of consumers wanted was GTA and games like it. It was understood by everyone that this was where the money lied. Even major names in the video game industry saw the shift and took note. This Grand Theft Auto 3 thing came out ah. and utterly changed the expectations <laughs> of the gaming community. And That's like literally overnight, everything changed. We, were, we had already started working on Jack 2. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing a focus group with, and two eight-year-olds were in this focus mm -hmm. group. And I was like, so what do you think? And they acted like 16-year-olds, like eight-year-olds. Well, oh, the graphics are good and we really like the gameplay. Mm -hmm. We like what you're doing and the expansion of the universe. Really, this would be a fantastic game for our little brothers. And mm -hmm. you're like, you're eight. What, what are you playing, Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> As a result, many genres suffered, but none suffered more than the mascot platformer genre. A tentpole of the previous generation died almost instantly due to being perceived as inherently for kids. Crash and Spyro sales fell off a cliff, Jack and Daxter pivoted almost instantly once they got feedback from focus groups, Sly was a popular niche series at best, Ty never really took off, Tack never really took off, and what the hell is a sphinx? The only one that I can think of, other than things like Mario, that survived and thrived would be Ratchet and Clank, which also had an inherently more outwardly mature presentation compared to its contemporaries. So hot take? GTA 3 was the game that killed off the 3D platformer genre until more recent years when they made a nostalgic comeback. Suddenly, the entire market shifted towards a more adult focus. It was understood that because of GTA's success, adult themes were in, and gearing your games towards a more adult audience was a surefire way to increase sales. Even games that didn't necessarily copy GTA's formula took note that the game-playing audience was looking for more mature games. That's why you saw the likes of Prince of Persia following on from the light-hearted Sands of Time with one of the most knowingly edgelord games in history, The Warrior Within. Unlike other trends throughout the history of games, this trend never really died. Mario-style side-scrollers, Doom-style boomer shooters, 3D platformers, graphic adventure games, these were all popular trends that eventually went away with the passing of the tides. But the generalized focus on the things that GTA 3 introduced, like more extreme adult themes and gameplay focused on freedom, is something that's still prominent to this day, and in fact, it's more prominent than ever. So when you take a look at the evolution of gaming and take a look at what was the watershed moment that shifted gaming from the perceived wholesomeness of the 80s and 90s to the prominently mature and adult-focused era we find ourselves in today, as well as the watershed moment that shifted design sensibilities from the rigidness of the previous generation to the extreme open-ended freedom of today, all that can be traced back to GTA 3. 
But can you really blame the game specifically though? Because given the increasing age of the average gamer at the time, a game like it was inevitable. If it weren't GTA, it would have been something else. A revolution was brewing for a while. All they needed was the spark to light the flame. Furthermore, gaming was eventually going to break into the mainstream in the same way as movies or TV before it. All it needed was a major killer app to show mainstream audiences that video games could be cool. There were adult games that came before GTA 3, but GTA 3 truly was the first game to shift the perception and make it an accepted idea that gaming wasn't just for kids anymore, and also, in my opinion, was the game that made video games mainstream, for good or for ill. There's certainly a debate to be made about when gaming went from niche to mainstream. Was it when the PS1 sold 100 million units? Was it when the PS2 sold 150? Did it go all the way back to the movie The Wizard? Could it have been another GTA game? Was it when GTA San Andreas became the best-selling PS2 game? Was it when opening day for GTA 4 became the best opening day for any piece of media up to that point, previously held by the opening day for The Dark Knight? There's plenty of interpretations you can make when it comes to this, but even if you don't pick GTA 3 like I did, it has to at least be part of the debate. It's funny to think of how many possible tipping points are tied into the release of various GTA games. That's how much of an impact this series has had on the history of gaming. And that's not to say I think it's the best franchise of all time, nor do I think it's one of my favorites, but it's certainly undeniably the most impactful series in the history of gaming, and created an entire generation of imitators. But Grand Theft Auto was something that was often imitated, but never duplicated. It remains the king shit of fuck mountain to this day, with GTA V, mostly due to the numerous re-releases, becoming the second best-selling game of all time, behind only Minecraft. As a matter of fact, I think the success of GTA V is ironically its biggest failing, because its success allowed Rockstar Games to go several years at a time without releasing any new games. And I still think they're one of the better modern developers, so I find that to be a shame. And honestly, I'm still holding out for my Bully sequel, damn it. Come on, Rockstar. Bully deserves a sequel. That game was awesome. So Rockstar Games became a victim of their own success, so who knows when the next GTA game is going to come out. But whatever the case, GTA 3 walked so the next GTA could run. If you like this video, be sure to leave a comment and subscribe for more. And be sure to share it around with your friends. And if you didn't like it, well, do all these things anyway. Or I will find you. I swear to God. Until next time, I'm the Monarch of Snark on Tactical Bacon Productions. Peace.